now for a meditation from the epistle by Paul to Philemon, the slave owner, is verse 10. I appeal to you for the sake of my child Onesimus, the word means uh, useful here, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Greetings on this Labor Day weekend. Greetings in the name of him who says, Come unto me, all who labor, and I will give you rest. Jesus. What a world of difference Jesus makes. The world would say, Come unto me, all of you that labor, and I will give you an added brick. The world piles on us all the time. Rules and regulations, some of them very bad, and some of them against liberty itself. And it wears people out. You see it more and more as time goes on. So what a good thing it is to be in God's house today and rest for the soul, for the body, for the spirit. Uh, Doris March has a very beautiful piece, uh, by strong word, that cleaved the darkness. So just running through Genesis, you played that and talked about the hardest working man in the universe, Jesus Christ. It was Jesus who, a labor of love, that created the whole universe out of nothing. It's Jesus who keeps the whole universe running 24-7 in love. The hardest working man, the God-man in the whole universe. Go to the sermon at hand. I had finished my sermon already Tuesday. It was all done, and I thought, ah, I'm getting the shade. Got it going real well. And then Friday, I get a phone call. Dr. Jeff Nerritt, a pastor in Greenville, Illinois, said, Peter, you got to preach what we promised to preach on back on August the 21st. And I said, yeah, Jeff, I'm going to keep my promise. But he says, you got to do it this Sunday. you got to do it this Sunday. Well, back on August the 21st, I was up in South Dakota for the installation service of the uh, fourth vice president of the Missouri Synod, uh, Nabil Noor, and I was privileged to preach to the pastors and to uh, the congregation uh, there at this wonderful gathering. Beautiful day, joyful day. Saul soon falls and the staircase falls there and so many other good things. And then at the end of the day, it was midnight and we were at his home and just praising the Lord for all the good things that had happened that day. I had only had a glass of wine, one wine, and we were just talking and enjoying one another in fellowship. And the bill, who grew up in Palestine, uh, said, Peter, uh, I'm thinking about preaching a particular sermon early in September. What do you think of it? Here's my title. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Um, anyway, I said, well, I started to get the giggles between being tired on the one hand and one little glass of wine. And I said, well, Bill, that phrase is kind of loaded there. You're going to have to unpack it very carefully. Well, long and short of it is, we got talking not only about that, but we segued into a whole different venue and menu, and we started laughing. We laughed for 45 minutes straight. Our signs were hurting. Uh, the fourth vice president of our Missouri Senate was rolling on the floor, literally. He was laughing so hard. We just didn't stop. And at the end of the day, we like to pray, and I was still giggling, I couldn't stop, so they put me in the corner. And they prayed while I was in the corner. But we just laughed and laughed in the good time of the Lord. But we made an agreement, we made a promise, and you got to keep your promise. If it's a good promise, I think this is a good one. Uh, if we make a bad promise, then we should repent and get rid of that bugger and move on in a good direction. But this was a promise that we would preach on the same weekend, who's your daddy? And so Dr. Nerrick is probably preaching this right now. I don't know what his sermon looks like. I did see the sermon of uh, uh, Pastor Neuer and read that last night. So we all made that agreement to preach on the subject, uh, Who's Your Daddy? <coughs> the angle that Pastor Neuer was going with the question is a good one. Because if a person in life does not understand their relationship to their ultimate father, God the Father, they're not going to really know who they are. They're not going to really know what love is. If you notice in the first two uh, scripture-loaded, Christ-centered pages of our liturgy today, we have a double text related to God the Father. 
You and I know that we are loved because God the Father sent His beloved Son into the world to be crucified on the cross for our sins, and that is our identity. Through His death and resurrection, we know that we are unconditionally loved, infinitely loved, on our way to heaven, and we have high heavenly hope. So it's very important. If people don't know who their ultimate father is, who's your daddy, if they don't know who their ultimate father is, they're going to drift in life. And they're going to turn directions that are not healthy, salutary, in time, and especially for eternity. Nabil was thinking of God the Father who loved us with an everlasting love and giving his son to die for us. In the Middle East, knowing who your father is is very important. Uh, he calls his father Baba, and his sons call him Baba, or Abba is also another word, a tender term. In the deepest sense, and I'd like you to think about this, not only now, but the rest of the day, in the deepest sense, if a person doesn't know who their ultimate father is, and don't know the love of God the Father, that's the root cause of all the problems in the world. No other religion uh, reveals anything about the grace of God the way Christianity does, and the love of God the way Jesus Christ does, or that God is our Father, such a tender term. Uh, it is unique there. Atheists who don't know their daddy, drug dealers don't know who their divine father is, uh, people who push this bad uh, science idea that we evolved from monkeys don't understand the power of God, the wonderful design in creation, and the design of salvation that God reveals to us. And it just causes people to be restless in life and untethered in life. And also, you know, when we raise this question, who's your daddy? In the minds of other people, it's going to cause other thoughts to go forward. There's a video game. I don't know. Tucker, have you ever played the video game, Who's Your Daddy? No, you look at me. Good. Okay. Well, I haven't either. I'm still with Kaneo for my now, people. Well, in the game, Who's Your Daddy, it's just a goofy <coughs> game, from what I understand. And uh, it's a video game. But where did this phrase kind of come up into our culture? It came up back in 1968. There was part of the British invasion, all the rock groups that came to America, and one of them was a group that was formerly called the Mustangs, maybe they should have kept that name, they changed their name from the Mustangs, not the Pintos, they changed their name from the Mustangs to the Zombies. Dave Youngbuyer, do you remember listening to the Zombies? Yep, he raised his hand there, yeah, that was music back in 1968, uh, the Zombies. And they had a song called Time of the Season, and here's the lyrics that gave birth to this phrase now in our culture, Who's Your Daddy? Listen to the chorus line from this billboard blockbuster of the zombies. What's your name? What's your name? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? He rich? Is he rich? Has he taken, has he taken any time, any time to show, to show you what you have to need? It's the time of the season. Well, I see that half of you never heard that before, <laughs> and that's okay. But it raised a very important question. Uh, people were looking for identity in the 60s. You go back there, and everything was untethered, and they were trying to say, in this cosmos, who am I? And that was one of the songs that wrestled with that question. Now, nothing new under the sun. Back in Jesus' day, the fatherhood of God was a big issue. John chapter 8, Jesus gets into a rip-roaring debate with the religious leaders of the people of his day. And the religious leaders of his day, for the most part, thought that they were saved by race and not by grace. They had departed radically from the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You read the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were saved by grace. Salvation was a gift. God came to them. God forgave, to them. forgave them. God gave them wonderful promises of salvation. Salvation was totally his free gift in the Old Testament as well. Well, anyway, we see this throughout Scripture. 
And from Genesis to Malachi, the very same message of the New Testament brings forth. We are justified by grace and not by our works. So, on Labor Day weekend, when people think about labor a little bit, but really more people think about rest and getting away from labor, but on Labor Day weekend, we kind of sing, not the labor of my hands can fulfill the law's demands. So on Labor Day weekend, if a person's thinking deeply and eternally and graciously, we kind of celebrate that it's not our labor that saves us, but the perfect labor of Jesus Christ in our behalf. Now, how does that relate to the question, who's my daddy? In the sense, if you believe in salvation by works, you turn God into a taskmaster and not God the Father. If you believe in salvation by works, you've got to answer this impossible question. How many works does it take to get to heaven? I had two Mormon missionaries at our doorsteps here years ago, and I asked them that question. And I asked them, how do you hope to be saved? And they said, well, believing in Jesus plus doing good works. And I asked them, how many good works? 100,000? 500,000? 10 million? A zillion? And they were perplexed by that question. But the moment you start teaching salvation by works, it's rather cruel because it throws people into uncertainty. And it implies that God doesn't really love a person unconditionally and can save them by grace alone, and it just messes with people psychologically. And so people are always trying to do things to put themselves in a right relationship with their perceived God who doesn't exist if he's a taskmaster, not God the Father. So it's a huge question. If you believe through salvation by works that God is your taskmaster rather than your father, you are under the law, the curse of the law, and not in the gospel. Your relationship is no longer based on unconditional love, but how you need to carry out all these man-made conditions perfectly to get right with God. And this quickly turns into a pyramid scam. The one thing in the world, and you may disagree with me here, and that's perfectly fine. This is sort of a freedom question. The one thing in the world I do not want to really see are the pyramids. People marvel, oh, how wonderful they are. When I look at them, I think of all the people that died, that were beaten, the slaves with the bloody backs, to build this pyramid to put a few people in the oligarchy at the top of the power there, and for me, that doesn't warm my heart at all. Now, you may be stronger and better than me and can look at the engineering feet and say, my, that was wonderful and good for you. But for me, at least, I think of salvation by works as a pyramid scheme, and I see all the damage it does to people. It quickly throws people into uncertainty and a very cruel one at that. And at best, what happens is that false doctrine slips into the church and people want to turn Jesus into a jumpstart artist to help you get to heaven, but not a savior when the Bible teaches he is our full savior, our wonderful savior, has done it all for you and me and more. The whole notion of salvation by works is a lie. It cannot be done. It's not the way of the God of all grace. And it doesn't recognize the core teachings of the universe and reality. In the beginning, God made everything out of what? Nothing. Nothing. That tells us something about how deeply dependent we are upon the Lord. 100% grace alone. Every good gift comes from God. Life, forgiveness, salvation, heaven, and the knowledge that we are loved. And therefore, it can get on with life and really live life. Over this issue, Jesus... And the religious leaders of his day spar back and forth. And the religious leaders were asking the question. They said, Abraham is our father, they said. He is our daddy. Well, Jesus, 1900 years earlier, had literally dined with Abraham, broke bread with Abraham, and told him that a son was going to be born a year after he appeared to Abraham, so he had the advantage of knowing Abraham very intimately and closely. 
And uh, Jesus said, well, if your father was Abraham, you would not be trying to murder me. And they were trying to kill Jesus at every chance they got. And later they would work with Rome. And the Jewish leaders and the Roman leaders in 24 hours would break, have seven trials. In all trials, they would totally throw the due process out of the law, of the law, out of the window. And so here what we see is that the religious leaders, for the most part, wanted to murder Jesus because they were at the top of the pyramid with all the power and their salvation by works scheme that came from the devil. Now, blessedly, there were a couple of wonderful exceptions to the rule. There was a remnant, Nicodemus, and Joseph of Arimathea, by the grace of God, understood that grace is the foundation of salvation. But the majority of the religious leaders perverted the Old Testament message of grace into salvation by man, into salvation by works. To them, Jesus speaks frankly because they turn the gospel message of the Old Testament into a false hood, into salvation by law. This is what Jesus says to them because of that. Quote, you come from your father. Now he's speaking to the religious leaders. You come from your father, the devil, and you desire to do what your father wants you to do. The devil was a murderer from the beginning. And that's what salvation by works does. It murders people. And it gets a false impression of God. It doesn't reveal his infinite love for us and unconditional love. Who's their daddy? Jesus said, the devil. Jesus knew that they were wanting to murder him right at that point without a shred of evidence. In fact, Jesus asked them, which of you can convict me of a single sin? And not a single one could convict Jesus of a single sin, and yet they wanted to put him to death. Now think of it. The perfect person comes to planet Earth, and what does Rome and the Jewish leaders do together? They give him the worst, most terrible, horrifying, horrific death in history. Isn't that indicting about mankind, unless the gospel opens up our heart and head? Well, none could convict Jesus of a single sin. Instead, they rounded up lawyers, and they worked it so that Jesus would be crucified and suffer a horrible death of pummeling, of uh, flogging, of driving those thorn of crowns in his head, and everything else. The most humiliating, horrifying death that they did. And in all of that, Jesus never sinned. In the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross, Jesus labored harder than any other man ever worked when you look at the details there. <coughs> I mean, here people are doing just shameful, contemptible things to him. And what does he do from the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, I've never been able to pray that prayer perfectly. There are times in life when maybe I'm filled more with the Holy Spirit and somebody does something very harmful to me, I can say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There are other times when things have been done, I've got to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But Jesus prayed the prayer perfectly for us as our great high priest. If anyone gets the real message of Labor Day weekend, it begins with the fact that God created the universe and labored in love to create this universe because he loved you and me. And then God planned our salvation in love in Christ before the foundation of the world. And then every single second since the world was called into existence, Jesus, as the one mediator between God and man, has kept the whole planet running. And he sent his holy angels even here on earth so that human beings do not destroy themselves prematurely. It is a cosmic arena in which Jesus works behind the scenes every day for the good of his bride, the church. Again, no one ever worked harder than Jesus to show us that we are loved unconditionally. That heaven is a gift and that all our sins have been paid for. For thousands of years, Jesus has come into the world in grace, in a multiplicity of ways, to turn our hearts toward love. And really, it's Jesus' love alone that moves mankind toward sanity and humanity. Today's epistle, real short summary, is the story of how a hardworking man 
who believed in salvation by grace, St. Paul, was an old man in prison, uh, facing death, and a slave had run away by the name of Onesimus from a slave owner, Philemon. And normally if a slave did that back in those days, they would either be killed or killed within an inch of their life. But Onesimus, whose name means useful, became very useful uh, through the gospel. He became a new creation. He suddenly looked at work in a different way as a calling, a vocation here on earth. And he became Paul's son through the gospel. Someone would ask Onesimus, who's your dad? And he would say, Paul. But ultimately, God the Father through Jesus Christ. Now, the Holy Spirit had led Philemon to know God the Father through Jesus Christ through Paul. And so Philemon looked at Paul as his father, the slave owner. And Onesimus looked at Paul as his father. So they were both sons in Christ. And beloved in Christ, this is the message that took down slavery in the early centuries. Brought forth equality. It's the only thing that really works for love and real progress and productivity, knowing the fatherhood of God through his beloved son who died for us, rose for us, dwells within us, prays for us, and gives to us the knowledge that we are just love beyond we can even begin to imagine. Isn't that good news for Labor Day? <laughs> And that's why St. Paul, knowing that Christ rose from the dead and a brand new glorified body was on the way, he said, so work for the Lord, knowing that your hard work through the Lord Jesus Christ would down our love for Christ in step with God's word is never in vain. And may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds in God the Father, now and forever.